countless CIA ops, ties to the mob, and oh so many romantic liaisons. JFK's administration is considered by many to be one of the better ones, but not everything about it was positive. The first questionable incident during the Kennedy administration actually occurred before JFK took office. One of the most pressing United States foreign policy matters in the early 1960s was the Cuban Revolution and the ascension of Fidel Castro to power. On the 1960 campaign trail, the head of the CIA, Alan Dulles, briefed Kennedy on the current state of U.S. foreign policy. Dulles reportedly mentioned Cuba, but nothing specific about any covert plans for an attack, something the Eisenhower administration was secretly planning with the CIA and what would become the Bay of Pigs invasion. It was clear that he was on a course taking Cuba and himself into the embrace of the Soviet Union. In their presidential debates, Kennedy's opponent Richard Nixon, who was vice president at the time, accused Kennedy of being weak on fighting communism in Cuba. Kennedy responded by putting out a statement in the New York Times that specifically called for the Eisenhower administration to help indigenous Cuban forces trying to oust Castro. Nixon, claiming he was protecting the integrity of the secret CIA operation, didn't acknowledge that the administration was doing exactly that. Instead, he called the idea dangerously irresponsible. Nixon was furious. He believed JFK knew about the invasion plan and was trying to make Nixon look bad. Nixon blamed his election loss on the incident. However, Dulles didn't brief Kennedy about the Cuba operation, and Nixon was mistaken. The 1960 presidential election was a remarkably close contest. Though in the Electoral College it appears to be a blowout, with John F. Kennedy winning 303 votes to Richard Nixon's 219, the popular vote was much closer, with 120,000 votes out of more than 68 million cast, or less than 0.5%. Leading up to the election, the polls had Kennedy and Nixon extremely close. Less than three months before, they were virtually tied in a Gallup poll, and on the eve of the election, they were within one percentage point of each other. Immediately after Kennedy's victory, however, there were claims of malfeasance, particularly in Illinois and Texas. Texas and Illinois combined for 47 electoral votes, which would have shifted the election to Nixon if he had taken both. Accusations poured in against Democratic Chicago Mayor Richard Daley and Kennedy's running mate Lyndon B. Johnson, who was a Texas senator at the time. Nixon supporters claimed both states engaged in ballot box stuffing and widespread voter fraud, insisting that the election was stolen. However, there has never been any conclusive indication of voter fraud from either state, though historians argue as to whether or not some discrepancies occurred in Illinois. Nixon never formally challenged the results. In 1959, Fidel Castro and his revolutionary army took power in Cuba. However, Castro soon drew the ire of Washington by entering contracts for Soviet oil and publicly announcing their comradeship with the USSR. The Eisenhower administration reacted to Castro's communist overtures by approving a CIA operation to remove him from power. The plan was to recruit Cuban exiles who had fled to Miami after the revolution, train them into paramilitaries, and send them back to oust Castro and take back control of the country. When Kennedy became president, he authorized the invasion, but it was a complete disaster. Word of the invasion had leaked. Castro's forces outnumbered those landing at the beach, and local Cubans chose to stand with Castro. Over 100 U.S.-trained Cuban paramilitaries were killed by the Cuban army, and nearly 1,200 were captured. Castro remained in power, and the Kennedy administration was thoroughly embarrassed less than four months into his presidency. Historians have laid much of the blame for the Bay of Pigs on decisions made by JFK. They mainly point to his insistence on starting the operation at night, his refusal to approve a second round of bombing, and his refusal to allow the Navy to back up Cuban forces. For many Americans living during the Cold War, the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis was one of the scariest times of their entire lives. That October, the Kennedy administration announced they had discovered the Soviet Union was moving nuclear missiles onto the island of Cuba, barely 90 miles off the Florida coast. In response, Kennedy immediately instituted a blockade around Cuba and issued an ultimatum, remove the missiles or risk nuclear war. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment on the shipment to Cuba is being initiated. When a U.S. reconnaissance plane was shot down over Cuba on October 27th, war seemed inevitable. However, at the last minute, Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev agreed on a compromise that involved the removal of the Soviet weapons and war was averted. Normally, JFK gets very high marks for his handling of the crisis, but what most people don't realize is that the Kennedy administration actually had information about their nuclear weapons a month and a half before. In fact, Kennedy first became aware of the sites after a spy plane photographed them on August 29th. But when he was informed, the president told his aides to bury the reports because he was worried about a scandal so close to the midterm elections. Then, after the U.S. spy plane was downed over Soviet territory weeks later, Kennedy grounded all U-2 flights over Cuba. 
That's how the Soviets moved 99 nuclear missiles on October 4th without the US knowing. When U-2 flights restarted, the missiles were revealed, kicking off the crisis. After the Bay of Pigs invasion failed, the Kennedy administration was still looking to remove Castro from power. So in January 1962, less than a year later, Kennedy initiated Operation Mongoose. Mongoose was a plot to remove Castro from power once and for all, and JFK's brother Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, handpicked legendary CIA agent Edward Lansdale to plan it. But Lansdale wasn't the only CIA agent working on the job. Another man, William Harvey, was also a senior operative at the CIA, who started on the project after being assigned by the former head of the clandestine service, Richard Bissell. After struggling to make any headway for months, Harvey decided on a new tactic. It would use the Mafia to assassinate Castro. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Harvey got in contact with mobsters Sam Giancana and Johnny Roselli, providing them with poison pills to give to Castro in Cuba, but the gangsters failed to carry out the hit. A second known assassination attempt under the JFK administration was a failed scheme to deliver Castro a scuba suit infected with fungus and tuberculosis bacillus. The suit was never delivered. After JFK's assassination in November 1963, the new president, Lyndon Johnson, shut Mongoose down. One of the biggest foreign policy issues that JFK inherited from the Eisenhower administration was a growing financial and military commitment to the fledgling Republic of Vietnam. Previously, when he served in the House and Senate in the early 1960s, Kennedy had gone on record against any U.S. engagement in Vietnam. During the first Indochina War between the Viet Minh and the French, he called the prospect of U.S. military aid to the French dangerously futile and self-destructive. However, by the time he was on the campaign trail in 1960, Kennedy was singing a different tune. Worried about Chinese Premier Mao Zedong's growing communist influence in Asia, JFK now favored much more aggressive tactics in Vietnam. He initiated a counterinsurgency strategy to combat the Viet Cong's use of guerrilla warfare and started to allow the direct participation of U.S. soldiers in battle against the communists. When Eisenhower left office in January 1961, there were only 700 so-called military advisors in Vietnam. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Yet within four months on the job, JFK had sent another 500 Special Forces troops and military personnel overseas, and within two years, there were another 10,000 advisors on the way. By the time JFK was assassinated, there were roughly 16,700 U.S. advisors in the country, 16,000 more than in 1960, with the violence swiftly escalating. While the conflict in Vietnam was escalating during the year 1963, some of the most cataclysmic events of the entire war took place. That spring, CIA agent Lucien Conin had gone into South Vietnam undercover as a spy. In May, he went to the former provincial capital of Hue to see the celebrations surrounding the Buddha's 2,527th birthday. However, while the celebrations were taking place, South Vietnamese soldiers and police officers assaulted and killed several Buddhist worshippers. In protest, a Buddhist monk, Quan Duc, doused himself in gasoline and immolated his body in front of the entire world. However, South Vietnamese President Ngoc Dinh Diem continued to escalate his government's war on the Buddhists, and his forces began to openly kill women and children in their pagodas. Soon, the Kennedy administration started secretly discussing plans to remove Diem from power. In late August, Kennedy approved a cable recommending action, and on the 26th, the ambassador to South Vietnam sent a return cable to Kennedy reading, we are launched on a course from which there is no turning back, the overthrow of the DM government. Well, all we can do is help, and we're making it very clear. But I don't agree with those who say we should withdraw. That'd be a great mistake. Vietnamese generals assassinated DM in early November with $40,000 in backing from the CIA. After it was done, Kennedy regretted his decision, immediately expressing dismay and disgust. However, without his support, it likely wouldn't have happened in the first place. When John Kennedy took over the presidency from Dwight Eisenhower, he initiated a major change in the CIA. It took some time because, at first, he was so upset with the agency over their handling of the Bay of Pigs crisis that he wanted nothing more to do with them. However, he soon changed his mind and started to supercharge their activities. Whereas Eisenhower's administration had launched about 170 CIA operations during his entire two-term presidency, Kennedy initiated nearly as many, 163, in less than one term. This meant the CIA was conducting operations at double the rate under Kennedy compared to Eisenhower, including the aforementioned plots against Fidel Castro. Much of this was carried out under the supervision of John McCone, who took over as the director of the CIA when Alan Dulles departed after the Bay of Pigs disaster. Initially, JFK considered putting in his brother Robert Kennedy as director, but thought better of it. 
According to John Prados in Safe for Democracy, not only did the CIA authorize 163 missions during JFK's tenure, but they had plans approved for nearly 400 more. NSA Director McGeorge Bundy, one of Kennedy's closest colleagues, has since noted how much pressure the administration started to exert over the CIA for increased covert missions. The first six months of John Kennedy's presidency were about as dreadful as you can get. First, election rigging accusations clouded his victory, then he presided over the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion in April. A month and a half later in June, at his first summit with the Premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, things again went poorly. Khrushchev, who was 67 at the time and had been a Bolshevik since the Russian Revolution, did not respect the 44-year-old Kennedy or even take him seriously. Advisors had warned him that the hot-tempered Soviet leader would use threats and intimidation to impose his will. Khrushchev compared JFK negatively to his predecessor, Dwight Eisenhower, and considered him immature. Kennedy, eager to prove himself to the veteran hardline communist, tried to debate Khrushchev on issues like Marxism and imperialism, but it only served to prove his own ineptitude and inexperience. At one point, Kennedy even told Khrushchev he considered there to be rough parity between the Western European forces like NATO and the Sino-Soviet alliance in Asia. It shocked Kennedy's aides that he would make such an assertion. While Khrushchev was thrilled at getting an American president to admit he considered the USSR military equals, after the summit, Kennedy knew he was a beaten man. When asked about the meetings with Khrushchev, Kennedy replied, Worst thing in my life, he savaged me. When World War II ended, one of the biggest questions for the Allies was how to administer newly occupied Germany. They decided to split the country into four quadrants, with the victors, the United States, France, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, each taking responsibility for one zone. The Soviets, however, wanted the other allies to leave Berlin, which was in the Soviet sector, and tensions increased when the West balked at the idea. In November 1958, Khrushchev gave a speech demanding the Western Allies immediately leave Berlin and pull out all of their personnel and equipment within six months. But negotiations between Khrushchev and the Eisenhower administration broke down in 1960 when the USSR shot down an American U-2 spy plane on a reconnaissance mission over Russian territory. Khrushchev decided to wait for the next presidential administration before renewing talks. At the Vienna summit with Kennedy in 1961, the Soviet leader again gave the US six months to leave Berlin. Kennedy responded by sending 1,500 troops to the German capital via the Autobahn and called up 150,000 army reservists. Then, on August 13, 1961, the East German government started to erect the now infamous Berlin Wall, separating East and West Berlin. The wall separated more than a city. It separated the world. Eventually, the wall was reinforced with concrete and it stood as a symbol of the Cold War until its destruction in 1989. After the Berlin Wall was erected in August 1961, tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union came to a serious boil. Later in the month, in response to the Kennedy administration's continued buildup of nuclear weapons, Khrushchev publicly announced the resumption of open-air nuclear weapons testing, ending a two-and-a-half-year moratorium. They conducted almost one nuclear test a day for the next two months, including exploding the Tsar Bomba, the largest nuclear explosion ever recorded. That September, Kennedy responded by resuming the U.S.'s dormant nuclear testing program. Back in Berlin, the political temperature was getting even hotter. In late October, at Checkpoint Charlie, one of the authorized crossing points on the Soviet-U.S. border in Berlin, a dispute broke out over the search of U.S. diplomats and their travel documents. The Kennedy administration responded by mobilizing several U.S. Army tanks to aim their guns toward the East German side. The Soviets responded by mobilizing their own tanks. Everyone was locked and loaded, waiting for things to kick off. Thankfully, cooler heads prevailed. Kennedy reached out to Khrushchev through clandestine back channels, and both agreed to remove their tanks from Checkpoint Charlie, ending the threat of escalation. In August of 1962, President Kennedy's attention was focused on British Guiana, a small country in northern South America. Guiana had been under the control of Great Britain since the late 18th century and had only recently been allowed nominal independence. However, when the British allowed open elections for the first time in the 1950s, the winner, Cheta Jagan, was immediately labeled a communist and thrown in jail. He was released a year later, and in the 1961 elections, Jagan's political party won 75% of the seats in the Guyanese Assembly, and he was elected prime minister. Almost immediately, Kennedy and the director of the CIA, John McCone, started to discuss possibilities for removing Jagan from office due to his perceived communist leanings. Jagan visited the White House that October and tried to convince Washington that he wasn't aligned with the Soviet Union. However, JFK refused to listen, and instead, he initiated a $2 million program for Jagan's overthrow the following August. Throughout 1963, the CIA supported Jagan's political opponent, Forbes Burnham. Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963 before there was any action. 
but the CIA, with British support, was able to oust Jagan from power in 1964 under JFK's successor Lyndon B. Johnson. When JFK became president in January 1961, the issue of communism in Latin America instantly became one of his top priorities. The recent ascensions of Fidel Castro and Chetty Jagan to power in Latin American countries made it clear that communism had infiltrated the Western Hemisphere, and Kennedy was determined to stop it from spreading. As such, in mid-March 1961, Kennedy announced the creation of the Alliance for Progress in Latin America. For no real progress is possible unless the benefits of increased prosperity are shared by the people themselves. The purpose of the alliance was to fight against inequality and poverty in Latin America by creating programs to help reduce illiteracy and improve public health. That August, Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline traveled to Uruguay to inaugurate the Alliance for Progress in Punta del Este. Unfortunately, the alliance was hampered from the beginning. Federal funding, originally pledged at $10 billion over 10 years, was partly spent on creating paramilitary armies to fight communism and never even came close to the levels of the Marshall Plan in Europe. Though there were some mild improvements to housing, education, and public health, overall the alliance was a disaster. Economic growth slumped below anticipated levels, unemployment increased, and no less than six military coups took place in Latin America during Kennedy's presidency. Rapid population growth mitigated many of the advances in poverty and public health, and most Latin American leaders feared Washington far more than they did communism. Hardly progress. While President Kennedy certainly had his hands full dealing with problems in Latin America, his policies toward Africa offered him little respite. While campaigning against Vice President Richard Nixon in 1960, Kennedy criticized the Eisenhower administration's attitude towards Africa. However, when he took over in early 1961, there was strong continuity between the two administrations' Africa policies. Kennedy was just as concerned with the rise and spread of communism in Africa as he was in Vietnam, especially after the Soviet Union started to gain a foothold in the northeast region of the African continent. Kennedy began to offer financial incentives to neutral African leaders in order to convince them to ally with the U.S. instead of the Soviet Union, but did little to champion true African nationalism and independence, and his policies in South Africa were even worse. Apartheid and segregation had been endemic in the country since the early 20th century, and in the 1950s, the racist policies were encoded into law by the Afrikaner government. Living, doing business or owning land in white areas was banned. There were separate public facilities, transport and schools. Interracial marriage was banned. The Kennedy administration did basically nothing to end Afrikaner rule in South Africa, engaging only in symbolic efforts to oppose the white supremacist policies of the South African government. He refused to institute economic sanctions and continued America's reliance on the country's precious minerals for trade. Kennedy did finally agree to sign an arms embargo, but at the same time he continued to sell them spare military parts, effectively and bizarrely undermining his own agreement. Another region of Africa that drew the close attention of the Kennedy administration was what was known as the Congo Crisis, which had actually begun in 1960 during the Eisenhower administration. According to the State Department's Office of the Historian, throughout 1960, the Congolese were preparing for their official independence from Belgium, something the Eisenhower team supported. But that June, a mutiny broke out, pitting Congolese and Belgium troops against each other, and soon the entire country was engulfed in chaos. In the midst of infighting in the new Congolese government, a colonel in the army, Joseph Mobutu, initiated a coup and seized power. The new Kennedy administration immediately supported Mobutu in his bid to create a stable and pro-Western Congo. They provided funds and signed bilateral military agreements. Kennedy even arranged for Mobutu to attend parachute training school at Fort Benning, Georgia as a testament to their relationship. Mobutu, who changed the country's name from Congo to Zaire and began to call himself Mobutu Sese Seko, ruled the country for the next three decades until he was finally deposed in 1997. Mobutu's government was incredibly unstable, and he constantly faced rebellions and coup attempts. He is also remembered for his corruption, having amassed an enormous personal fortune while presiding over a poverty-stricken and economically stagnant nation. Yet without Kennedy's support, he might never have come to power in the 1960s. At first, it may sound surprising, but beginning with Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1930s all the way to Richard Nixon in the 1970s, every American president at some point allowed secret recordings of their meetings. Lordy, I hope there are tapes. In fact, during his time in office, John Kennedy was one of the most prolific secret tapers of all. In spring 1962, Secret Service agent Robert Bauck installed JFK's concealed recording system in both the Oval Office and the Cabinet Room. Is this thing on? JFK died before ever having to explain the secret taping system, which was only publicly revealed in 1973 during the Watergate hearings. 
Kennedy's secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, has suggested that it was installed for the purpose of keeping accurate records. She also claimed that Kennedy had it put in because his advisors had a tendency to agree to things in private, only to publicly claim the opposite, and JFK wanted to be able to hold them accountable with their own words. Regardless of the reason, Kennedy and a few Secret Service agents were the only ones with access to the taping systems, which were controlled by concealed switches. There were microphones installed in multiple places to make sure as much was recorded as possible. In total, Kennedy racked up nearly 250 hours of taped meetings and 12 hours of recorded phone calls from spring 1962 until his death in November 1963, much of which has now been declassified. Since his assassination on November 22, 1963, JFK's legacy has repeatedly been subjected to sensationalized rumors about his private life. The most notorious among these are his alleged extramarital relationships with a number of women. JFK is suspected of being involved in at least six clandestine affairs. Several of the women were supposedly members of the White House staff, including interns and secretaries, and many of the women have claimed the relationship started in the late 1950s or 1960s, when Kennedy would have been either a senator or president. Unfortunately, there isn't a ton of evidence to support whether or not most or any of those affairs ever actually happened. JFK was never given an opportunity to confront his accusers before his death. However, several Kennedy aides, like Barbara Gamarakian, have confirmed some of the stories about his infidelity. Where sex was concerned, John F. Kennedy thought he was untouchable, invulnerable. The most famous accusation revolves around an alleged affair he had with actor and superstar Marilyn Monroe. There is some speculation that his wife Jackie knew about the affairs but tolerated them. Unfortunately, it's likely we'll never know the complete truth about Kennedy's private life. Another area of John Kennedy's private life that is rife with speculation is his and his family's alleged ties to mob figures like Sam Giancana and the Chicago Outfit. The rumors go back to the 1960 presidential election and the accusations of ballot stuffing and voter fraud. There have long been allegations that Kennedy's father, Joe Kennedy, contacted Giancana to have the Chicago mob rig the election in his son's favor, in exchange for not prosecuting their various crimes once JFK took office. There are also allegations that Frank Sinatra contacted Giancana on behalf of Joe Kennedy to ask the mobster to flip the election for his son. However, there is no evidence to support any of these allegations. The biggest accusations connecting Kennedy to the mob were made by Judith Campbell Exner in her memoirs. I can at this time emphatically state that my relationship with Jack Kennedy was of a close personal nature. Exner wrote that she had affairs with both Giancana and Kennedy, and that she tried to introduce them to each other in 1960 to help fix the election. However, her stories at times contradict each other and were vehemently denied by Kennedy's closest aides. It is true that Kennedy's CIA and Giancana were working together to assassinate Cuban President Fidel Castro, but that wasn't personally arranged by Kennedy himself, but rather by CIA agents Richard Helms and William Harvey, though Kennedy may have been aware of the scheme through his brother, Attorney General Bobby Kennedy. 